are live, but we're also on tape. We are in the bowels of Lee's music. That's Chris Folds. A little late today. No, we we have a later interview today, so I'm on time. Ten past nine, just yes. on, on your time this morning. Mm -hmm. I'm Marty Hastings. Uh, that's Mike Miltimore, the famous Mike Miltimore. Did you catch his uh, his piece on Global last Global, night? Global, Jay Durant. Yes, yes. He's 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 now even more famous than he was before. I love the part where he's shaking hands with uh, Prince William. Prince, Prince William. Yeah, I know he's royalty. <laughs> Who is this guy? Yeah. <laughs> Who is this guy? Get away from me. Put on some gloves. Love the show today. We have Peter Millibar on. What are we going to talk about with Peter? The legislature has a fall sitting that just began this week. It's 24 days long, and uh, Peter is the Canlis North Cam. Kenless North Thompson MLA and he's the house leader and he's also the critic for indigenous relations so we'll talk about uh, the recent national day for uh, truth and reconciliation he attended the event at uh, Tecumloops and we'll talk about what the BC Liberals hope to hold the NDP's feet to fire what issues uh, this fall. And he's a bit of a hockey guy himself. He played for the Nanaimo Clippers, you were he, telling me? Well, he, he's played a bit for the Junior A Nanaimo Clippers. Uh, Nanaimo and Merritt, incidentally, are the longest tenured Junior A franchises in Western Canada. Okay, and that ties in wonderfully because we're talking about the Blazers today, uh, home opener Saturday night. So we've got Dylan Garand, Logan Stankoven, two big deals, and uh, head coach and GM Sean Clouston. Also have a neat little weird kind of story about something that happened with Georgia Aldis from the TIA yes. Wolfpack soccer player. And you and I right now, I called you last night real quick and I said, let's not talk about this, but I have a feeling that you want to talk about this too, the drive through They ask you how you're doing. Why do they do that? Well, it's customer relations. They're, they're taught that in their customer relations course to, uh, to be pleasing to the customer, to, to, to feign that they care about how you're doing, even though they don't. We used to have a boss, Kelly Hall, second, second week in a row that he's been, that he's been <laughs> mentioned on the show. Kelly Hall, as you know, used to come in at 7 in the morning and run, run around, how you doing, how you doing, how you doing? Didn't matter what you say because he wasn't listening. You could yeah. say, oh, my cat died, my wife left me, my truck broke down. That's great, that's great, Chris, <laughs> see you later, right? <laughs> it's all about management. It's all these buzzwords. It's about, you got to do this, you got to do this. So when you go through the drive through I'm sure that lovely young girl at the, at the window, maybe she does care how you're doing, but what do you care? I care. Number one, she does not care how I'm doing. You, 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 you don't know that for sure. She, you and, assume that. And even if she does, she is not prepared to find out how I'm doing. That's true. In that small amount of time, too. Um, it's all about efficiency. The drive through is all about efficiency. That's what it's there for, right? So let's cut out that question, how are you doing, which they don't want to know and I don't want to tell them, really, and just say, what can I get started for you today? If I'm a manager of a Starbucks, that's what I want, too. And also, you think about this. There's going to be that chatty Kathy who's going to be like, oh, yeah, you know, took Tommy to soccer practice and his shin pads are, I got to go to the consigner because his shin pads are broken. Meanwhile, you've got five cars behind right. waiting to get their coffee and start their day. They're at the drive through to get through the drive through quickly. More, more importantly, every word you speak leads to our demise through global warming because of these <laughs> idling cars, which brings me to the next point. We shouldn't be, we shouldn't be using drive throughs unless under certain circumstances. In fact, the city of Kamloops, which has this great climate action plan, and they really want to you know, do their, what they can to, 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 uh, to combat uh, you know, global warming, uh, the one thing they didn't do is ban drive throughs and they should ban drive throughs If the city wants to cut down on global warming, and if you want to cut down on inane chatter, park your car, walk in like, like a normal human being, say hi to people, watch the people interact with each other, buy a coffee, walk back out. Today, I came here, and I was 10 minutes after normal, and I went to the North Kamloops McDonald's, because this is the best coffee of any fast food, bar none, if you don't think so, you're clueless. There's 11 cars on one side, and there's 10, I counted them, there's 10 on the other, and they're all converging. And I'm not gonna s wait in line for that, it's ridiculous. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I have no handicap, I'm, I don't have a baby screaming in the car, I don't have a dog that's gonna be barking. I walk in, walk out, and the car that was at the end was just getting to the order window. Yeah, I don't know, I just, I have manners. I was brought up with manners. So if they do say, how are you doing? I'm roped into, I'm fine, how are you doing today? Okay. What I really want to do is grande pike with two cream. And what you should do... Grande macchiato. Well, first Let's of all, go. you shouldn't be at Starbucks. That's a little bit, you know, shishi poo poo. But what you should do is park that, you know, 1927 jalopy that you have. That's also contributed to global warming. <laughs> You're obsessed with my gym. There's nothing wrong with it. And you should walk in 
And it's good for you. You get some fresh air. I do walk in a lot of the time. In, when I see the massive lineup, which is there because people are chatting for no reason, right. I go inside. Yes. And then I have to talk to other people and waste my time. Right. You're, you're late today. Why are you late today? Probably because you're meandering around. And you think there's, and you, and you wonder why you're single, why you can't find a girl. Yeah, sure, maybe, sure. maybe one of these girls who, who is your, of your age, she might ask you a question and but there might be sparks. Here, sparks here. over some uh, latte uh, fomachaka, whatever here's, you eat. Here's a business idea which might interest your wife. Let's make a Starbucks slash psychologist barista. How are you doing? Do you really want to know? Do you want to be burdened with this? Wave me inside. Let's set up a booth inside. Make hey, you, extra money. you go away from the attendant. We can let's do twenty three sessions. Let's yes. go fifty six sessions with you at the Starbucks, That's and right. you can really get in here if you want to. You still be single probably after all those sessions. Here's 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 the one other thing though that um, that that really drives me nuts, and I think you'd agree is like you know how you doing. I think that's a that's an innocent thing. What I can't stand, and maybe it's showing my age, maybe an old man yelling at a cloud. But when you walk in and you say thank you, and they say no worries, I'm drives a no worries me, guy. Drives me nuts. I'm a no worries no, guy. You say I, you're welcome. Yeah, I I, I don't know. You I don't say no I, worries. I say no worries. We're not in a rap album. You, you say Just you say <laughs> rappers don't say no worries. <laughs> yeah, but unless they're Australian, <laughs> no worries. You, yeah, no, well, I think I, the no worries. You, you say cheers. Way, you say cheers way, to JF and all way your emails. Too, way too casual. When when I'm when I'm interacting as a business transaction, I don't mind them saying how are you doing, but I don't want to say no worries. I might How have are worries. You what if I had worries? How are you married? Right. Your wife number three probably coming up for you. <laughs> All right. So that's the, the banter of the day. I think that went The bottom well. line is if you, if you park <laughs> your truck. We're not done yet here. You, you, park, you park your truck, you walk in, and you probably don't have to worry about anyone asking how you're doing. Okay. Fair enough. Let's move on. Uh, you know who doesn't have a drive through window that should? Herman Hothi. Well, old Hermos and I, we've been through a lot together, haven't we, buddy? And now we go through the changing of the seasons. What's that? He likes my jacket. 40 bucks. Sean John, Value Village. Speaking of top quality, which we were. New Leaf Produce Market Juice. It's the best in the business. And October 30th, where are you gonna be? You're gonna be in Merrick. They bring the commercial juicer out. They show you how it's made right in front of your eyes. Buy the juice. Check out the apples. It's apple season. Pumpkins, Halloween. And maybe you get to meet the man himself. Hermels. I think we need to set up some counseling for the two of you. <laughs> <laughs> we should just have, bring somebody in here to sort out our issues. Do you recognize everything on the table? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, everything except uh, are these parsnips. That is uh, turnips. Well, that, no, those are purple top turnips. Yeah, turnips. There, I got it on the second clip. And then we got apples and pears and uh, garlic. Red Russian garlic from Armstrong. Garlic, eh? Hefley Creek peppers right here, local. We got beets, Granny Smith, uh, Winfield apples, Ambrosia apples, and Anjou pears. Didn't know those existed, but they're all at uh, New Leaf Produce and Market. And the cherry juice, which is fantastic. Did, yeah, did you have some of it? Uh, I haven't tasted it yet. But, tasted, uh, yeah. it, it comes in with this huge bag, and I'm not sure how long it, it lasts if I poured it into like, a big container. <laughs> I, I found out firsthand, actually, I let some sit in my fridge for a while. You don't want to drink it after about two months. Oh, two months is not bad. I mean, yeah, okay. It's good, good for about a month. There's a, there's a due date on it, but it's, it's fantastic huge, juice. I huge can speak bag from there. experience. Yeah. It's, it's great. It reminds me of a bag of wine that I have at home, so I kind of, of mistake it one night. Yes. That's probably why you're late this morning again. Mm -hmm. Last week, Cleek, what did you think about the segment last week? I thought it was good. It was uh, fresh and it was uh, uh, informative. And um, uh, it just it, and I like how, how it introduced the faces of the reporters' bylines to the people and what they're working on. And I think the reporters are liking it, too. Yeah, Jessica's getting out there in the field and doing it. Michael's throwing his comedy in, and Shandy is just to the point, shining his light. Mm -hmm. So let's see what they have to say today. If you are a Kamloops taxpayer, then you are officially becoming a part owner of this. Late last week, it was revealed that the city of Kamloops is in the process of closing a deal to purchase the Northbridge Hotel here on Tronkeel Road, as well as a property out back on Campbell Avenue. The Northbridge Hotel is was formerly known as the Village Hotel and is perhaps best known of late for being home to the currently shuttered Duchess Nightclub. There's the front doors. In the days since this purchase was announced, leaked then uh, <laughs> announced, a lot of people have been weighing in on what they'd like to see for this property. Some ideas have been market housing and um, 
perhaps commercial on the ground floor. And the city says it's also planning to um, partner for affordable housing for the Campbell Avenue property. But now that Kamloops taxpayers are essentially part owners of this, these two properties, um, and with everybody kind of weighing in on what they'd like to see for the future of this property on the Tronquil corridor, kind of the main strip, I guess, <laughs> ironically outside the strip club, um, of the North Shore, which is a main neighborhood of Kamloops. I'm wondering what you'd like to see here in the future. If you have any strong opinions, one way or another, I'd recommend writing to your city councillors. You can write to the paper, give us your suggestions. We'd like to see, or what you'd like to see. So Monday marked the National Day of Action for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. And uh, there's two stories in the paper this week timely to that. Uh, one is the uh, unveiling of a sculpture over at uh, the Skeetches and Health Centre near Savannah. Uh, that's from Kamloops artist Vaughn Warren. And it was actually a very collaborative effort uh, behind the sculpture, so there's, there's a lot more to it. Um, you'll also see some red dresses uh, hanging from the trees over at Thompson Rivers University and also in the art gallery. Um, that's part of the Red Dress Project, uh, and you can find some more details about that in this week's paper as well. Um, you'll also see some entertainment news from me this week. Uh, there's the unveiling of Western Canada Theatre's new season. That's going to happen on Wednesday evening. Uh, there's also a collaboration between the Canlis Art Gallery and the Canlis Museum and Archives that uh, looks interesting as well. So a little more on that. What I wanted to touch on uh, for this episode was the uh, double police standoff that we had at two motels here in town. Uh, there was one at, uh, at a motel on the 1300 block of Columbia Street and then one over at the Motel 6 in Valley View on the frontage road there. Usually when we go to these scenes... It's, uh, there's not a lot of information from police and you're there, you're just trying to get your bearings and, and figure out where the best place for a shot would be while also navigating, you know, police line. And it's a difficult situation, but, uh, you know, when I, when I was at the scene this time, uh, what was interesting was I was, you know, standing around, uh, checking, checking out the scene. I noticed a police officer walking towards me and another reporter. And I thought to myself, ah, we're going to get moved along, told, you know, move back because, you know, obviously there's a. Uh, level of danger with these situations uh, but she came up to us she's like you guys meet him we're like yeah we have to move along he's like no no it's fine let's uh, just go around here and we'll, we'll do a little media scrum here we'll give you guys an update uh, and that's not usually something we get at the scenes uh, here uh, when it comes to these standoffs uh, so it was a really great change of pace just to uh, you know have that information come down from police at the scene usually we have to kind of like wait out the situation and get uh, you know like a short update here by email so it was nice having that presence at the scene and that update uh, it was really helpful uh, in covering the story and uh, uh, you know also helpful was uh, once we wrapped up there at that scene and went over to Valley View uh, police were I think were probably stretched a little bit thin with them having both both scenes kind of going on at the same time so I didn't there wasn't really any uh, uh, media liaison there from the from the police but uh, when I went there, they had the city's bylaw officers doing traffic control, and they had the whole frontage road uh, cut off so much so that you couldn't really even see the the motel where they were amassing at. But uh, you know, I just went up to the guy and, and told him like, you know, who I was. We're just trying to get the story out to people, and you know, the guy was like, yeah, okay, that's fine. Uh, he, he got an update from his supervisor, and they're like, yeah, let him in, and just let me walk walk in. And he escorted me to a safe distance, and I was able to get my shot. So it was also nice uh, to just have that, that cooperation there. Uh, but that's all for me for now. Back to you guys in the studio. I loved all three of those clips, but I do want to focus on what Mike had to say because at our paper we've had some kind of um, tough times we've got through with, with dealing with the police and interaction with the police. Um, can you expand on that? In the past, not just KTW, but all the media in town, we, there, was a, there was a period here where it was really hard to get information out of the police, and it became a more adversarial relationship um, a few years back. Uh, there is a new um, media relations officer, Constable Crystal Evelyn, who I think has done a wonderful job. Uh, the, previous, the previous officers, they did good jobs too, but a lot of them are hampered by what they can say. A lot of them aren't, just, aren't, aren't tailored for the job. Mm -hmm. She's a former reporter from Ontario. Mm -hmm. She became a Mountie. Her, her, she and her husband are both Mounties here, and um, and she, and she is uh, she's doing a really good job, and she's trying to get us the information she can. And, and the biggest thing is, if she can't get us information, she tells us why, 
So that leaves us, okay, fine. Before it was like we'd never know and the, the media would get angry and it, it became a pretty toxic relationship between, between the two. Yeah, and how does that affect our newsroom when the relations are cold? Well, it, it, it affects it in the way that the reporters might go elsewhere to get sources, to get information. Tim Petrak, a former reporter, really good court, court and cop reporter, he would get a lot of information um, off book, as they say, and a lot of, and some of it would upset the police because maybe they, they, there was information they didn't want released. And, and we had many meetings with the police and, and came to the understanding that, you know, there's certain things that we, you really can't say because of this, this, and this, it affects the investigation. If there's an open dialogue, we just want the people to know what they should know. Uh, they don't you know, need to know rather than want to know, and that's what the police always go by. Let's move over to your uh, segment, which is about the faults. Northbridge Hotel, and I think you want to tie it into maybe homelessness. Well, yeah, it's it's the ongoing issue in town is is uh, is uh, homelessness and the mental addictions and the um, and the uh, men mental health and, and addictions and just the whole problem in, in in the city that they're trying to uh, trying to address through the various levels of government. This is the Northbridge Hotel, uh, also known as the Village Hotel. Back in the day, it was built in 1956. Most people in town just know it as the Duchess because the uh, the main tenant there is the now shuttered Duchess. Uh, Strip club, which um, the city purchased this this building and a lot behind it, an acre lot behind it, for a total of seven point one million dollars, and they're they're planning on redeveloping it, um, and they're going to sell the back half lot back to BC Housing. Does for that include that little building? Sorry, does yeah. that that yeah. little building in the back there? Yeah, the little building in the back is the former uh, liquor store of this hotel, and it's on a one acre lot, so it's Campbell Avenue. So there's two two distinct properties here. The city bought both of them from the the owner. And uh, with the intention of selling the back lot for about three and a half million back to BC Housing, BC Housing is planning, as far as we know, to build affordable housing for seniors and families. Uh, there will be no shelter here, no homeless shelter, no um, Spiro House type of thing. Um, and and then the front part, the hotel, the city down the road is hoping to sell it to a developer to make into market housing. You know, maybe some nice commercial stuff on the on the front, maybe some condos up top. Uh, right now, the taxpayers bought this thing for $7 million, but in the, in, in the future, they'll probably make money off it because they'll sell the front for more than that. What do you think it should be? Um, well, that's the thing. I mean, the taxpayers own this thing, so everyone should have a say in it. Right now, there's a lot of people saying there should be student housing in there. There should be uh, housing for seniors, uh, for single mothers, just for families who can't afford a house right now. Uh, it's not, not, not just, not just you know, your, your stereotypical homeless on the street. There are people who are who are technically homeless because they can't afford to uh, to rent a place for two grand a month. Um, and then there's others who say, well, there should also be a shelter component there. Glenn Hilke, the, the well-known social advocate in town, says they should have a shelter as part of this thing because the homeless situation in town is really, really dire right now. Um, and then there's all critics also who say, well, some developer is going to come in and get a sweet deal and build something that's out of the, out of the reach of the average Joe. Uh, what we do know is this is and has been quite uh, you know, a notorious place. Uh, if you look on canvasthisweek.com and you just type in Northbridge Hotel or Village Hotel, you'll see many, many stories crime related because it attracted a lot of element of, of criminals there. People living there now um, are, are not that element. The people living there now are a lot of uh, people uh, who are clients of social agencies in town who need places to live. So this is basically a social housing right now. Has Hilke or any one of his ilk kind of spoken up and, and had their take on it? Yeah, yeah. And if you go to canvasthisweek.com, there's a big long story Jessica did uh, just, just last night, yesterday, about, about uh, peop various people's views of this. Jeremy Heighton, the uh, North Shore Business uh, Improvement Association Executive Director, who's been on the show, he's very, very um, excited about the possibilities of revitalization here. Glenn Hilke, uh, on the other hand, thinks that... Uh, um, um, sort of gentrification is, is another extension of white colonialism and, <laughs> and he is against any kind of improvement here. He wants to use it to help the needy because that's where he's, he's coming from as he told us on the show a few weeks ago. How is the decision made and what's the timeline for a decision on, on what this becomes? There's no, there's, no, there's no timeline. There's nothing to be happening for at least a year. So the people living there, the people living there who are clients mostly of social agencies who have many, many problems, they're going to stay there. The Duchess remains, will never open again. In fact, that's an interesting side, uh, side, side uh, line to this story. Uh, the Duchess was the last strip club in Kamloops. The, uh, the, there used to be uh, two when I moved here. The other one was the Rendezvous across the river. When the Rendezvous closed, and that became, that's now a homeless shelter. When the ron Rendezvous closed um, about 10, 12 years ago, uh, that ended a 101-year run of strip clubs on the south shore of Kamloops. Mm. This is now closed. 
And there can be no other strip clubs opening in Kamloops because about a decade ago when the rendezvous closed, the city passed a bylaw banning these types of establishments in, in, uh, in licensed establishments. So this is an end of an era, really, um, as a sidebar story to the actual revitalization of this property. Yeah, people used to tell me that at the rendezvous you could get lunch there. If you're at university, just I had a no burger there once after playing hockey at the ice box. The ice box, another place that's that's closed. It seems like everything's closing in our lives as we get near death. Eh? Everything's just closing yeah. and closing. We're focus on the positives here. I know, but uh, but uh, yeah, we played hockey. Uh, you know, shinny hockey, and I actually went to the rendezvous the one and only time. It was after hockey, and um, I had a burger, and it was pretty good. Yep. Okay, that's good. We also actually we had lunch at the Duchess once. So we there, as, as I think it's a newsroom lunch we, almost. We, we were there for work to be sh to be clear because that was when the owner announced they were going to close and it became a big story. And then a week later they saw we changed our mind. The sale fell through or whatever, and and the girls kept dancing. Any excuse? Yep. And any excuse to move on to the title of Hastings. Part of my job is to cover the TRU Wolfpack. That right there is Georgia Aldis. She's been playing with the women's soccer team for five years now, and I had never spoken to her until this past Monday. Oh, we got the sirens going. The men are finishing at 3 p.m., and the women are starting at 4 p.m. So my plan was to go talk to the men, I'll go back to the office because it's very close, and I'll come back and talk to the women. God bless him, Cam Doherty of the TIE Wolfpack, their new media man. He's doing a good job. He's doing he? a good job, yeah, doing a good yeah. job. He brings to CFJC, because they're out there, Georgia Aldis and the coach, Mark Pennington, so I can now talk to the men and the women and, and, and be gone. Bottom line is I'm completely unprepared to talk to Georgia Aldis. I didn't know she was going to be there. We start talking, and I'm kind of BSing my way through this interview, and it turns out that she was basically as a favor brought to this media conference because in five years she had never been interviewed before so the coach brought her so we're chatting and she starts talking about how the team's not scoring goals and i ask an amateur hour five-year-old question like oh how many goals have you scored in your career so i apologize to you this is your fifth year and we've never had a conversation how many goals have you scored in your tiu career don't ask me that question. <laughs> That's probably why we haven't talked before, because it's been none. <laughs> okay, well, what would it be like to get your first at home in your fifth year? It would be it would be insane. It would be a dream come true. Um, I'm a center back, so for center back, goals don't often happen. Um, but it would be the perfect, perfect cap off. Let's get you up on the next corner kick in the, in the box <laughs> and, and, and center backs. You, you can score your first yeah. header. We're calling it right now, okay? Yeah, you can pass that on to my coach and then we'll see what happens. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. No goals, five years. And uh, it was an entertaining conversation, I thought. So I used it again on CBC Radio, Friday mornings, Daybreak with Shelley Joyce, and kind of doubled down, had fun with it. I said, you know, paging Mark Pennington, paging Mark Pennington, George Aldis to the six-yard box, and kind of said, like, let's, let's get her a goal. Yeah. Lo and behold, Friday night, first game in 720 days with fans, friends and family there. She hasn't scored ever. 80th minute rolls around. TRU's awarded a penalty shot. And who's bolting to take it? Did you have a feeling you were going to score on the weekend, or did, was, was there something weird in the air this past week? I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, after talking to you, and after realizing it's my last year, it's a big first weekend in front of our fans, there's definitely an extra kick in the butt to, to make something happen, for sure. You know, PKs are all about mind games with the goalie, and I had the Trinity Western goalie come and stand right in front of me, and she's waving her arms trying to get in my head, and the whole thing is not to make eye contact, right? You can't let her get in your head, so you just have to stay in the zone and uh, pick a place and then just hit it. Did you know, I, I saw the video, the kick, mm -hmm. you kind of have a technique where you almost like you start straight on, and, and then, but did you know you were going to the right side the whole time? Marty, you're telling my secrets. <laughs> 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 but yeah, I have a spot picked out before, before I even hit it, yeah. And how did it feel to, to actually score that goal? It's like a feeling like no other. It was unreal. I think I, I think I blacked out. Like all I remember is getting in front of the ball, hearing the whistle blow, putting it into the back of the net, turning around and seeing my team and running into someone's arms. So it was an amazing feeling. Some people, when you interview them, they're just not very yeah. good, or they're just nervous. Whatever. She is just like a natural. Oh, she, she should have been interviewed for five years straight. Exactly. But she mentioned she's been injured for two of those five years. So, but yeah, she she was great. Not a great season for the Wolfpack women so far. They're last in their division, but the men are number one, tied for number one. They're yep. both at home again this weekend. Two weeks in a row. Yes, yeah. but they'll be competing on Saturday night 
with the Kamloops Blazers home opener. Are you going to be there? Uh, I think I think on Saturday. I think I am. Yeah, I think I'm going to. Well, I got to check and make sure I get a ticket because it's still half capacity, right? Yeah, you got to think they're going to sell that. Do you think yeah. people are going to be reticent or worried about going to these games? No, no, because I heard uh, that there's. I, I heard that they're probably going to be close to selling all the tickets available. In fact, I got a friend who's got a couple, so I got to call him up. No, I don't think so at all. If you look at the uh, preseason game, they had more fans than in a regular non-pandemic year. And if you look at well, down south of the border, they're all filled, and even the Canucks had had fans last night at their exhibition game. Uh, the Lions and the Whitecaps are selling out to what they can. Mm-hmm. So no, I don't think so. I think if people who get vaccinated and people you know wear their masks where they have to and just do what they do, what they do, I think it's safe. I agree. I think there's a huge demand for it. Yeah. And this team is uh, it's in in good with the city right now. They've got momentum. And uh, I talked to them. Did you see? Well, in our newspaper today, you can check out. We've got it's a, a big six BC page, division. Yep. Six page uh, Blazers uh, WHL preview. And then also in the sports section, we have a, a full feature on the BC division going, you are drilling deep into each team and then what, uh, and what, uh, what, they, um, what we can expect from each team. Right, so I asked about the BC division. So we're going to hear in this clip from head coach and GM Sean Clouston from Logan Stankoven, recently signed with the Dallas Stars, New York Rangers prospect Dylan Grand. I asked them about the BC division as a whole, and they were very complimentary and aware of Kelowna, who are going to be a good team this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, Prince George is an up-and-coming up-and-coming team. team. Yep. Probably Vancouver. still not no. at yep. the level. Victoria, in all likelihood, is going to be at the yep. bottom of the division. But I chose the clips about the Vancouver Giants because that's the team I think that you're really going to have to look out for this year. They're the suitors to the Blazers' crown. So here's a few clips from the Blazers. I think we can go all the way with our roster. Um, you know, I think we have a younger roster again, but uh, you know, I think we've got a good crop of of you know some 05s, some 04s, and obviously some solid 03s coming up, and some good veteran leaders that uh, you know have been here for a few years that you know you know how to put, put the puck in the net and, and uh, can take charge. So I think we got a good mix, and obviously our goaltending is is spot on. Yeah, I think Vancouver is going to have a great team. I mean, they've obviously added some key pieces. And they've got better. You know, they they have great structure. They're they're a well coached team. They're going to be a veteran group this year, so it's, it's going to be a challenge each and every night you play them. It's probably asking Vancouver to battle out for top dogs, so, um, you know, they're a pretty good team, and, and we can hang around with them, so, um, you know, obviously we're a pretty good team, and you never know what can happen down in the playoffs. Um, you know, it's a different game. Too bad we haven't got that experience in the last two years, but regardless, I think, you know, it'll just make us more hungry that, you know, we didn't really get that opportunity when we know we deserved it. It'll be uh, Camloops, Vancouver, tight, Kelowna. Prince George, Victoria. Yeah, I just think this city really deserves this season. Logan Stankoven could have like an all-world type year. And maybe like we haven't seen anything like this with a local kid like this exploding onto the scene and NHL draft pick and finally the, the pent-up demand for fans to be in the building. Yeah. Saturday night's going to be great. I can't wait till we got a packed barn and let's yeah. open this thing up safely as we can and, and get a full house. Maybe we can ask our next guest about the Kamloops Blazers. He's a hockey guy. His name is Peter Millibar. We had his son-in-law on not too long ago, Jeremy Nishaw. Yep, that's right. That's Peter Millibar, I don't know, circuit 2016, 17, 18 at a KMBA opening day, an LED photo with oh, a yeah. young girl there on opening day. And uh, what do we know about Peter Millibar? Who is he? Peter Millibar is our Kamloops North Thompson MLA, BC Liberal. He's also the house leader of the official opposition, and he's also the Indigenous uh, relations critic for the official opposition. And uh, this week he is in Victoria with fellow MLA Todd Stone as the fall legislative assembly uh, began. And he's a busy man and we appreciate him joining us right now. Peter, can you hear us? You betcha. Thanks for having me on. I'm also our uh, environment critic. I got that. Well, there you go. He's got, more, more, more. <laughs> yeah, he's got more critics than uh, Siskel and Ebert. There you go. Before we dive into politics, I don't know how much you heard of our conversation, but Chris and I were kind of BSing about uh, drive through etiquette. When you're at the drive through it seems like they want to ask you, how are you doing? instead of just, what can I start for you today? Would you rather they cut out the how you doing question or are you okay with that question? I'm okay with the how you doing question. I, I'm actually more frustrated with the perpetual upsell because if you could just <laughs> say your whole order, uh, A, we'd probably be more accurate more often and B, you usually are going about to ask for some of the stuff that they're trying to insert in, would you like, would you like, would you yeah. like? And I know they're doing their job and they have all sorts of 
bonuses and competitions on, on would you like bacon with that and stuff of, of that nature. But uh, that's probably more frustrating than the how you do it. Yeah, too much filibustering. I was hoping you could use your power to make some changes there, but I guess not. Chris, let's start with some real questions. What do you got? Well, this this week, uh, uh, Peter, you 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 attended the uh, Tecum Loops National Day for Truth and Reconciliation event, and uh, you were quite moved by it, as as everybody who was watching it and in person uh, there. And in in the legislature, uh, I think it was yesterday or was it Monday when you you you, you, sp- you spoke about it was it was a quite quite powerful speech. You said it's 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 one thing to to recognize it, but more importantly, we have to believe it uh, extrapolate on that what, what did you mean by that well that was that was actually as i was listening to to the various indigenous leaders speak it, it struck me as a non-indigenous uh, uh leader myself um that you know leader after leader was saying that the truth must come first and then we can have true reconciliation and they're absolutely right about that uh, but what struck me was indigenous leaders indigenous uh, community members uh, have been speaking the truth uh, for quite some time, um, and and in discussions that I've had with people, um, you know, post uh, uh, the revelations around around the, the burial sites, uh, not just in Canals but around the country, there's still a, a lingering, surprisingly, a lingering um, questioning around, you know, did things like this really happen, and and was it not just from TB, or was it, you know, so. It struck me that, that really the, the missing piece right now is that the non-Indigenous communities need to start to, to fully embrace um, by believing um, what they've been hearing all along. Do you think that's happening more in Kamloops now, people believing? Oh, I think absolutely it is. And, and to be fair, I mean, I grew up in Kamloops. Um, you know, that, that school is, is, uh, is very visible, obviously. We all know that. Um, you, you just thought of it more or less as a school. Um, you didn't know and you didn't hear uh, within community those stories being told. Certainly within the Indigenous communities, those stories were being told, but they weren't being shared wide and far. Um, and, and that's a that's a shame. And, and they should have been. And there should have been an earlier um, understanding and recognition of what was actually happening and not just in counts, but across the country. And if it could happen in a school that that is that focused and, and central and visible in an urban center. Um, you know, imagine uh, just uh, sadly what was happening in those more far-flung remote schools. Yeah, I think you just need to talk to any clinical counselor or therapist in town and they'll tell you all about uh the, the people they speak with and, and the trauma they have. Now, Prime Minister uh, Justin Trudeau today on October 6th released a statement finally. He apologized for going to Tofino and not, not accepting the invitation to come to Tecumloops, but he said he will visit Tecumloops within the next few weeks, so I'm assuming he'll be here sometime in October. So he's, he's going to do that to try to do whatever his part in reconciliation and, and, and fixing that uh, more than a faux pas. What can a provincial government do that has not already been done to further this message of yours? Well, I, I think the other message that was coming through loud and clear uh, on on the thirtieth in, in, in to come loops was that um, you know the time for hollow words and empty promises is over. Uh, real meaningful action needs to happen, and, and I agree with that wholeheartedly. And I've said that in the legislature many times, talking about um, um, reconciliation issues and, and moving forward. And I think that's that's the key. And so, you know, as as a legislature, we we passed unanimously uh, under. Uh, and it's now referred to as DRIPA, and, and uh, it, you know, the, let's not let the acronym uh, get in the way of what the spirit and the intent is supposed to be, and, and that's about making sure that provincial laws and, and ways of doing things are aligned with, with um, Indigenous rights and, and, uh, um, and issues that they have and, and proper consultation and, and, and proper um, uh, buy-in on certain projects or, or uh, laws. Uh, unfortunately, what we're seeing so far uh, with this government is uh, bill after bill after bill. Um, when we go into what's called committee stage, where you you can ask in-depth questions about each uh, clause and section within a bill to get a better understanding of what the government's intent is. Um, you know, we have been, and, and the House Leader, I've asked all of my caucus to do this, uh, ask uh, on every single piece of legislation uh, what consultation was done, uh, you know, what, what parts of UNDRIP were, were uh, dealt with and implemented within this legislation. I'm hard-pressed to think of anything over the last two years uh, 
that has actually been properly consulted or even remotely consulted by the government? The answer keeps coming back, well, we don't have to, we don't have to, we don't have to. Um, that's what Indigenous communities are loath to hear because, uh, you know, when the government passed on DRIP, and we voted in favor of it, but there was a lot of pageantry that day. There, there was a lot of Indigenous leaders, uh, very optimistic and understandably so, that came to the legislature. We had a special protocol in place that had never been done before in terms of people on the floor, extra people on the floor in the legislature, uh, to witness that bill uh, being made a law. Um, and, and the commentary I hear from Indigenous leaders across this province is that they feel like this is just yet turning into yet another governmental document that had great promise uh, with zero action behind it. From, the seven, from 2017 to about maybe the beginning of this year, I'd say the NDP got kind of a pass from the media and from the public, aided by the, the, the crisis of COVID and maybe also by, by the opioid crisis, giving them a chance to try to correct it. I think that pass is passed now. I think uh, there's been a, a number of, I, I guess you, you could say, uh, mistakes or, or, or poor performances from the wildfires to the, to, to, to the COVID back and forth that confuses people like hell, to the opioid crisis that's only getting worse, and also locally to the Broken Promise uh, Part 2 of a cancer care clinic with a radiation uh, component. Uh, and that one is still, I know Radio NL has a, has a running clock. You know, it's been <laughs> 75 days since Horgan promised to go there and, and clarify what he said to all of us, which was it'll be built within four years. So. That's a long-winded way to say, what are your focuses this, this, uh, this fall session, this short session, to keep their feet to the fire? Well, to be clear, what, I, what NL is trying to get the Premier to clarify, because the Premier committed to me in under questioning that he would clarify it, was he said six and a half or eight months ago now uh, that the Cancer Centre was already at Treasury, Treasury Board. Board, yeah. And he is, which means it's basically almost getting ready to go out and, and have a contract to it. Mm -hmm. um, he then had to admit that it's actually not a Treasury Board, uh, but he won't come back on and actually clarify that, that uh, the public have been totally misled where this project even is, and even in its planning infancy stage, let alone actually construction and fund it. Um, but overall, I think that really does tie into that overall theme. And, and I think you're right. I think the, the honeymoon is over. Um, the lack of transparency we're seeing around COVID data and things of that nature, lack of transparency in general from the government has been very, very poor. Um, you know, the confusion that we're seeing with COVID policies has been very, very poor. Um, we asked a full question period with the questions yesterday on, on heat dome response and 570 people dying unnecessarily because the province ignored their own commissioned 2019 climate adaptation report. Um, no answers to that. Um, you know, last session when we were here in the spring, we asked, uh, I think it was 509 questions of the Premier in question period. Uh, he answered, uh, I think it was about 85 or 86 of those or attempted to. And when you say answer in question period, it means he got up and, and gave a non-answer usually, but at least he got up and, and addressed it. Um, People want better accountability than that. And that's really what we're striving as, as an opposition is to, to make sure that, um, you know, those questions and those concerns that we're hearing through our constituency office are being addressed by the government. Uh, that we're at least getting an answer or an understanding why certain things are or are not being done. Um, instead, we're not getting that. And so, you know, you look at something like Car 40 and Kamloops, uh, that, that the mayor and council have been very clear they want to see more funding for. Uh, the mental health and addictions minister just keeps saying, well, that's interior health worry, not mine. I'm hands off. Um, you know, that's simply not good enough. We have cities all over this province that want to see uh, more mental health nurses with, with police officers to try to actually uh, deal with those types of situations in a proper way. And the government just shrugs and, and tries to blame a health authority. Um, you are actually the government. You are in charge of the health authority, not the other way around. And so those are the types of things we're trying to dive into. And, and frankly, the Premier can't hide and duck uh, forever. He misses more question periods than he attends, even though he's physically in this building. Uh, he just chooses to not show up and actually be held accountable. Uh, it's like he can't be bothered. Um, and I think that's a real disservice uh, to the public in general. Your, your daughter is one of our peers now. She's her husband for a while. She's in the media. Has her joining the media changed your outlook or, or changed the way you see the media at all? No, not really. I mean, uh, she went off to university and had talked about being uh, a journalist from high school. So when she when she came back to Kamloops after uh, um, uh, being down in the States, 
Um, you know, I wasn't surprised that she tried getting into the media. If anything, I was probably a detriment to her getting hired into the local media just because of my my job and career. So we've tried very hard, uh, both stations she's worked at, to, to, to not have her cover things that I do. And, and she's very much her own person and her own entity. And I think she's proven herself to be a... Um, you know, a worthy journalist and, and fair and, and open and, and certainly the government and ministers, they know that she's related and they don't hesitate to do interviews with her and things of that nature. So, um, you know, I think it, it, it hasn't created on the work side really any change there. Um, you know, I, I've always uh, had a, a good relationship, I think, with the media. I, I believe uh, we should be accessible. I think you, you, you've you always found that. Um, you know, you have a caucus meeting going on right now, literally right above my head from my office. And uh, I ducked out of that um, and, and made sure that I had portions of the meeting that I need to deal with dealt with so that I could jump on this call as well. And, and I've always tried to do that, right? And so... I still do that. I, I find it very much as as we have a job as opposition to hold the government account. Uh, media does as well, and and um, so um, I don't think it's really changed my outlook on on the media. I, I'm not going to lie. There's days I grumble when I see certain uh, <laughs> uh, writing of some articles, and there's other days I'm cheering away because I want the good side of that article, yeah. and that's just human nature. One last thing about getting back to the legislature, probably the most important thing, is that you can get to go back to the dining room. And I know the <laughs> dining room, and I've seen the menu and the food there. The menu looks fantastic, but more fantastic. The prices are amazing, so I can't wait to go there and eat. What's your favorite item on the on the dining room menu? Um, I actually don't go to the dining room a ton anymore, uh, but probably my go-to, and it goes back to when I was a kid. I just I just order a clubhouse, and uh, yeah. don't tell my wife because I'm supposed to uh, avoid gluten, and I never order it with the gluten-free bread. But um, <laughs> just as long as he's not expensing tea at, at the Empress, I think yeah. we're we're okay. Uh, <laughs> one more uh, one more softball, and we're going to let you go here. Hockey question: You had an illustrious hockey career. We we know that. <laughs> Uh, just want your take on on the Camelos Blazers this season. What's the ceiling for this team? Well, to be clear, like millions of others, uh, I'm a legend in my own mind for how I was with hockey. But uh, uh, no, you know what? I'm excited to see the Blazers uh, get started back home. I, I'm certainly looking for. I'll be there at the home opener on, on Saturday myself, and and. Uh, you know, I think it's just going to be really exciting. They got such a great crop of young kids with Logan and, and everyone else leading the charge. But then you even look at the the, the ages just slightly under that, and and they they actually do have a, a pretty good potential for a several year run uh, of, of some pretty strong strong teams and, and hopefully dominance. And so um, that's what I'm looking forward to. I joke around uh, Shirley Bond, obviously, our interim leader. She's uh, from Prince George. So uh, the other day I stood up and I said, uh, by the way, I didn't get the scores from the weekend. So anyone know what happened with Prince George and Kamloops? So, uh, there was some good nature ribbing back and forth there. But, uh, you know, that's, I think, what we've been missing as, as a community, right, is that that ability to kind of have that shared experience at a Blazer game and the cheering or the the disappointment of a tough game or uh, the excitement of an overtime win and those things. So, um, you know, I, I think it's going to do well for not just Camels and the Blazers fans, but all those WHL teams and all of those fan bases out there. I think it just adds that little level of normalcy that uh, we've been missing as a society. Absolutely. All right. Thanks for your time. Stay away from the uh, pregame festivities because they're giving away free hot dogs and Leanne's not going to like the, the, the that, I don't think so. <laughs> Stay away from those. We appreciate your time. Thanks a lot, Peter. Thank you. Hey, thank you guys. Anytime. Yeah. Yeah. Thoughts on the interview with Peter? Good. Yeah. No, uh, I, I've always liked Peter Millibar. He, uh, he, he was a city councillor. He was a mayor. Now he's an MLA. Uh, people might not like his politics, and people get kind of nasty on social media with uh, not just with him, but with everyone. But from a person-to-person level, there's not many politicians I've ever met who who aren't nice people. They're not there to be uh, to be horrible people to ruin our lives. They're there to make decisions they think that are in our best interest. But um, anyway, I think uh, just having a beer with him once in a while when he was mayor, uh, good guy. Yeah, I think he probably is right when he says he, he, he thinks he has a pretty good relationship with the media. I think he has over the oh, year. Yeah. He's been pretty accessible. Yep. When I talk to him, it's usually something stupid like, you know, are you going to give Colin Bazarin yeah. uh, wine if the Blazers lose or something? So I don't deal with him on the heavy stuff like, like other reporters uh, do. Okay, that's the end of the show. It's been fantastic. I want to thank Magic Mike, the famous one himself, Magic Mike Miltimore and Bonnie. He's, he's uh, a friend of royalty. Yes, and we were talking. We might have to clone Bonnie because Mike's got so much business coming in from his guitars and people wanting to do stuff like this. So we are glad that uh, he has us here in state-of-the-art studio, too, in the bowels 
of Lee's music. I also want to thank the Grand Ones, my guy Scott Finley and the Grand Ones for the music that uh, he lets us use. So beautiful. October 30th in Merritt, Apple Fest. Come and see the commercial juicer. See Herman in action. Chris, can you buy some time where I get Herman here? At, uh, at Purity Feed. Purity Feed. On, uh, I think it's on Vote Street, right downtown Merritt. Oh, I didn't yeah. know that. Okay, yeah. Yeah, you can meet, meet uh, Herman and I might be there myself. Thanks for your time today and we'll see you last week.